two, three, out, four, Can everybody hear me? Just check the mic's working. Thank you. Come in, join us, please. Plenty of room at the front. Shall we start? At the end. Okay. Good evening, everyone. At the end. Am I audible at the back? Okay, great. So, um, hard day? You have learned a lot all day through. And again, an opportunity to interact with uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Ellen Higgleton, international oh, publisher of Collins India and Collins Learning. And she is here today to talk about dictionaries and corpus, how new words are being created all across the globe, how certain things are done, how the language has changed over a period of time. So I hope it would be interesting. And those who had attended yesterday's workshop or the quiz with Ellen would definitely agree with me that um, she happens to make everything very, very interesting and engaging for you all. 
I hope you would have equally energetic and enthusiastic session today. Over to Dr. Ellen Higgleton. Thank you so much. Thank you. I've got a collar mic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming. Um, the theme of everything I'm talking about this year at Tech is language change, particularly language change for English. Could you put your hand up if you came to the work, to the quiz yesterday? I know some of you came. Okay, so I'm going to play a piece of video that some of you have already seen. For some of you, this is a new piece of video, and I want you to listen very, very carefully, okay? And what this guy is speaking is English, okay? And we're going to start with this because it demonstrates, in a nutshell, how much English has changed in the 1,200 years of its history. So we're just going to listen to this to start with. One. Wheat. Wheat. Two. Wean. Wean. Three. Eald. Eald. Four. Starn. Starn. Five. Bart. Bart. Six. Knicht. Knicht. Seven. Kneu. Kneu. Eight. Cheerzan. Cheerzan. Nine. Leozan. Leozan. Ten. Ritan. Ritan. Now, those are words all in Old English that were spoken in about the year 1000. And I think you'll agree that was an extremely hard set of words to understand. Stan is stone. Eald is old. Chilzan means to choose. Ritan is to write. Wheat is white. Huin is wine. So the language has changed enormously in the thousand years since people were speaking like that. And English continues to change. It's a dynamic language that is changing all the time. So, how do we at Collins monitor language change to make sure that our dictionaries and reference books are up to date? And does language change really matter to you as teacher trainers to, to teachers here in India. We're going to think about what the corpus is, first of all. It's a collection or a body of words. It's currently 4.5 billion words of English sitting in a database made up of newspapers, magazines, books, transcribed spoken data, websites, and blogs. It's not just raw data. All of the data is annotated. So it's annotated linguistically so that we can say we want to look at a particular word according to its part of speech. So, for example, we might want to look at club as a noun or club as a verb. We can separate those out. And all of the data is tagged for its source, where in the world it comes from, whether it's from India or the UK or Australia or Canada. And it's all tagged for the type of text it comes from, if it's from a newspaper or a book or a fiction title, a novel or a magazine, or if it's spoken data that has been transcribed. And it's also stored, annotated for its date. And we have data going back to 1990. So a lexicographer looking at the corpus can say, OK, I want to see how this word was used in 1990 and I want to see how it's used today and can compare the findings. And the corpus complements the lexicographer. We're going to see, we're going to do some activities in a bit, and we'll do one activity which shows you why you can't rely on the corpus data completely, why we still need a lexicographer or a dictionary editor to analyze the data and to interpret the information. So, to start with, I'd like you all to think about the word club as a noun and club as a verb. 
So, can you shout out some senses of club as a noun? Group of people. Yep. Yep. Weapon? Yep. Anything else? Sorry? A club? Yes. Card suit? Yes. Anything else for club the noun? There's one missing. One major one missing, or two major ones missing. We've already got that. What about the game of golf? What do you play that with? A club? No. And then what about the weapon? A club? A club to, to, yeah, a weapon we've got. So we've also got the golf stick. Okay. What about the verb? What does the verb mean? To batter somebody, to club someone, yep. To batter, to put together. Anything else? I think that's about it. I think that's about it. Now, would you be surprised to know that one of those senses up there is only used here in India and isn't used in any other English-speaking market? And corpus allows us to find the sense that is only used in India and that isn't used in any other English-speaking market. Anybody like to suggest which one it is? It's to put together. In India, you use club like this. We've clubbed the money to buy him a present. In every other English-speaking market, we would say, we clubbed the money together to buy him a present. Okay? But corpus allows us to identify that this is a usage that's only used in India. Okay? So it's an extremely powerful tool. We can see where words and meanings are used. We can see how often words are used. We can see what words, how words are used together, what words are collocates. And as with club, we can see regional variation. And we can see register variations if a word is formal or informal. And we can use it to see grammar patterns and usage, to select typical examples to guide users, and we can use it to track new words coming into the language. And we're going to look at all of this in a bit more detail in a minute. But just to give you an idea of what we're looking at, when we look at the corpus, we can look at it using four different views. We can look at the concordance view, the what's called the word sketch view, the thesaurus view, and the sketch difference view. And we're going to look at those now, and we're going to look at some data from corpus. This is what the corpus concordance view looks like, and this is club as a noun. Okay, and this is just the first screen. There are 6,246 screens with concordance lines for the noun club on it. Okay? Gives the name, it gives the number up here. It gives us the total number of times the word appears in the corpus, the hits, and it also tells us the source for each citation. And this first screen all happens to be British books. BR books means British books. And if you were working on a dictionary and you were interested in any of these, you could click on a citation and get the whole paragraph. So that's the concordance view. It's not very helpful because everything is there together. And if you wanted to look at the noun club, to look through 6,000 screens of data to try and see what's going on is very hard. So we have a more helpful view, which is called the word sketch view. And this shows us how club is used with other words. And this is much more useful. So it's exactly the same data, but it shows us how the word is used. So object of, this shows us 
all the verbs that are used with club. So you might lead a club or love going to a club or own a club, own a football club perhaps. This column, subject of, shows us all of the, all of the verbs where club might be the subject. So the club is struggling to do well in matches. The club is chasing a championship title. Um, the club was hurled, club the weapon sense, hurled across the road, across the room. Adjective, subject, shows us all of the adjectives that are used with club. A nationwide club, the club is unwilling to take on this player and all of the modifiers used with club. And you can see, because this has been done from British sources, that we've got lots and lots of modifiers here, which suggest we're talking about football clubs and cricket clubs. English club, Spanish, Italian, Scottish, Welsh, big, Italian, former, exclusive. Okay? And that's because of the data that we're looking at. So that's a much more useful way of looking at the noun club and seeing how it's used in English. So for example, here we can see in this shot that the top two verbs up here are join. Join a club. Join is the verb that is most commonly used with the noun club. We join a club, a swimming club, or a golf club, or a sports club, or a, um, a social club. And swing a club, that's the weapon or golfing sense. But it really allows us to see how the words are used. And this blue number here is the frequency. So the higher the number, the more frequent that use is in our data. So when we're writing a dictionary entry and we think, OK, um, what collocations, what usages do we need to show a learner? Then we'll use this information. So we would need to show little children that the noun club is used with the verb join because you can see that's very, very common in our data. We also have this view, which is the thesaurus view. This is the thesaurus view for intelligent. And what the data does is it looks, it does some very clever parsing using patterns of words, part of speech tagging, and the semantic structure in sentences. And it comes up with a word cloud that says, look at this. Clever is the most common synonym for intelligent. But we're going to come back to this later, because this is a little bit misleading. This information can't be used on its own. Okay. The next view that we have to look at, and we're going to give out an activity now, is this. This is called the sketch difference view. And this is a really valuable view for dictionary editors, because it shows us the difference between words. So this is the sketch difference view for the words trip and the words shopping. OK, so do we have some helpers, please? I'd like sheets to be given out. You might need to share. So please share. There might not be enough. So if that can go this side of the room, and I'd like to give these out, this one out, this side of the room. So have a look at the, have a look at the sheet. Please share, because I don't think there's enough to go round. So please do share. Have a look at the sheet and work out which word goes in the, in the blanks. Is it trip or is it journey? And when you've done your sheet, count up what you've got most of. Have you got most trip or most journey? Fill in the blanks using either trip or journey. Sorry? No, 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 no. Just fill in the blanks. It's not a test. It's just to show how we use corpus to look at usage.
Have we, have we got any more sheets? There's a gentleman here with nothing to look at. No, I think they're all gone. Is there any, are there any more? Are there any more? Okay, apologies, sir. Have we got one here? Here? Sorry. Okay, great. Of oh, this gentleman? Okay. How are you getting on? Have you finished? This should be really easy for you. Well, do it quickly. Who's completed sheet A? Which sheet have you got, A or B? B. Okay, so tell me about sheet B. Sheet B, is it predominantly, is it mostly trip or is it mostly journey? Sheet B is a journey sheet. And what about sheet A? It's trip, exactly. Great. Okay. I'd now like to give these out. And I want you to tell me from looking at these, again, you might need to share. What's the difference between sheet, uh, trip and journey? These are sheets that have got this. This is a sheet that's got that on. All of the words that are green go with trip, and all of the words that are red go with journey. If you could take one and pass them on. Please share, please share, because I don't have very many. Yeah, please, please share, please don't. Sorry, yeah. No, no, please share, ladies, I don't have enough for everybody. If you haven't got one, have a look at this. It's the same. Please share, because we don't have enough for everybody. What's the difference, would you say, between trip and journey, looking at these collocations? I'll read some out. The green go with trip. Shopping, fishing, road, camping, canoe, ego, hunting, ski, Round the world, field, raft, overseas, week long. I'll read out some red ones now. Red words go with journey. Arduous, homeward, perilous, spiritual, fascinating, poignant. What's the difference? Trip's not general. Trip is for what? Is a trip horrible? Do you hate it? What I'm trying to get at is a trip horrible. It's for fun. Shopping, skiing, round the world. What's a journey for? Is a journey fun? It's not even necessarily a nice adventure. Arduous, perilous. So the sketch difference Allow, screen allows us to see the differences in the connotations of words. Both trip and journey denote traveling from one place to another, but the sketch difference allows us to see how they are used with different connotations. A trip is positive, it's fun. A journey is difficult, arduous, perilous. And it's these kinds of nuances that we need to ensure are in our dictionaries to make sure learners can use words properly. Okay. okay. So, another very valuable use of corpus is neologisms, new words, and change over time. Uh, we're going to have a look now at the word footfall. So, if we can be giving out the next handout, please. Thank you. So the word footfall is a fairly new addition to the language. It was added to our dictionary online in 2013. 
and it means the number of visitors to a shop or tourist attraction. Okay? Has everybody heard the word football? Okay. This is the concordance view of the word footfall. Okay? And it's not a very frequent word. There are only 20 screens. There are only 389 examples of it in corpus. It's not very frequent yet. But that's the concordance view. The word sketch, which I've just given you, highlights the other words that are used with corpus. Okay? So what I want you to do is to look at the word sketch and see if you can work out the three most common adjectives used to describe footfall. Have a look at the word sketch that you've been just being given. It looks like this. Which adjectives are most commonly used to modify or to describe the word footfall? What? No. Look. Have a look. Have a look. If we're teaching learners about the word footfall, what do we have to teach them it's used with? Okay, that gentleman had one. Would you like to say it? Heavy. Adjectives. We're looking for adjectives. Heavy. Soft. And what else? Average. So if we want to improve our dictionary entry for learners, we need to show them examples with the use of heavy footfall, soft footfall, and average footfall. Okay? And the word sketch allows us to see that these ones are the ones that we have to use. Okay? Now, with verbs, yes, it's increase and here, but with adjectives, it's heavy, soft, and average. Interesting, because the opposite of heavy is light. But in this context, the opposite of heavy footfall is soft footfall. Okay? Heavy, soft, average. So if we want to improve our dictionary entry, and you saw at the beginning we just had a definition, we might put in things like this. Increasingly heavy footfall at the Taj Mahal, soft footfall and a slowdown in sales, and average footfall for the time of year. All inspired by the corpus examples and by what the word sketch has shown us about how footfall is used. Okay. Can we save questions to the end, please? Thank you. So corpus is really good for identifying new words, but it's much cleverer than that. We can also monitor changes in grammar and usage and grammatical structures, because even the grammar of English is changing still. And we can also monitor new senses. OK. So this is a fairly recent uh, usage that's, been, that's starting to occur in English. It's progressive tenses with ing. But hang on a tick, I'm forgetting my manners. Nobody is imagining that the Conservatives can win the next election. I'm wanting the film to be deliberately old-fashioned. When I go and see that next Amma Khan film, I'm really wanting him not to get the girl this time. I'm loving Midnight Blue Eyeshadow. This is something that you hear in India. I haven't heard this very much in India. Very much so? I'm wanting, I'm loving the new sari. I'm loving the new henna, henna hairdo. So that's fairly new. And what corpus also allows us to do is to put together a graph like this. So in 1990, it wasn't used very much. 1995, starting to be used a bit more. 2000, used a bit more. 2005, Look how much more frequent this usage has become compared to 1990. Look at what 15 years of language change 
is doing to the language. That progressive love that we hardly heard in 90, progressive reporting structure, that we hardly heard in 1990, is much more common now. And then this one as well, be like as a reporting structure. We saw that and we were like, oh my God. You know, I saw him coming into the hall and I thought, oh my God, what has he done to his hair? And I was like, oh my God. They look at you as if you're mental and it's like, chill out, what's your problem? Okay? And this is a, an even cleverer graph of what's been going on with be like as a reporting structure over time. 1990, used a bit. 1995, most of the lines have declined a bit, and then they've all started to increase. But let's talk about what these different lines represent. Let's look at this little blue one at the bottom first, the little tiny blue dots. Hardly used in this type of English. That type of English is UK with the verb you. We don't use this structure in the UK with you. This red little tiny dots, that's US. English with the subject pronoun you. Used a bit more in the US with the subject pronoun you than it is in the UK, but not very much. This next one is UK, he, she, they, he, she, and they, this blue dotted line. This next line here is UK, it. This next line is US, he, she, they. This is UK, I, we, this solid blue line. And this red line here is US, uh, it, and then the big solid red line is US, I, we. So this shows us, if we compare that usage in the UK with that usage in the US, we can see what? It's an American usage predominantly, and that it's really got popular round about here. So if we were to do some research, digging back, we might find mid, mid to end 1990s, perhaps it was used on a really popular television show, and that's where people have picked it up and have started to use it from. So we can be really clever with usage. We can see how it's changing. We can see how it's changing between British and American, Indian and UK, India and the rest of the world, US and the rest of the world, and we can drill down really tightly if we think something interesting is going on with different subjects um, and with speaking and with writing. Okay. Uh, we've now got another exercise. So if sheet A can go this side and sheet B can go the other side, Please share. We don't have enough to go round for everybody. Please share. This side, you have sheet A, and this side, you have sheet B. Look at the corpus evidence for your word and think about what senses you would need to put into a dictionary for that word. Based on the corpus evidence that you've got on the sheet, what do you need to put in the dictionary? What senses do you put in your dictionary? Yeah? You need to look at that, see how this word is used, and work out which senses, what it means, work out what it means based on this evidence. Okay? Just based on that evidence. Yeah. What, what does it mean? What does that word mean based on this evidence? Not what you think you know about the word, but what the evidence is telling you about the word. What does it mean? <coughs> no. 
What does it mean? The meaning of the word. What does the word mean? How many meanings can you find in your corpus evidence? Read them through. Read the lines through and work out the meanings. How are you getting on? How is A, group A, doing? How is sheet A doing? What meanings have you found on your sheet? Okay. What about sheet B? What have you found? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Let's write them up. Mouse sheet A, what sense have you got? You've got a little rodent with a long tail. Have you got any other senses there in your citations? Are there any other senses there in your citations? Oh, you've only got the animal. All of your data is from 1990. Okay? What about this side? What have you got? You've got the animal and you've got the, the little computer mouse as well. Your data is from 2014. Okay? So we can see how the corpus gives us information about, um, about how words are used. Right, let's vote. Everybody please Close your eyes. I don't want anybody to see how the voting is going. Everybody close your eyes. Okay, now everybody close your eyes. Now please put your hand up if you think that on the 28th of February 2015, if you think the rodent sense of mouse is the most frequent. Okay? Great, thank you. Put your hands down. Now keep your eyes closed. Close your eyes. Now please put your hand up if you think that the computer sense of mouse is the most common now. Thank you. Put your hands down. So the vote was overwhelmingly for the computer sense. And you're right. This is a graph showing how the frequency of mouse has changed, how the frequency of the senses have changed over the last 12, 13 years. 1990, the computer sense was hardly ever used. You don't have any citations in your corpus for the computer sense in 1990. 2012, though, the computer sense is now more frequent than the rodent sense. And the flip over happened in about 2008. So we can even pinpoint exactly when some language change happened using our corpus. Okay. Here's another word that's got a very, very contemporary new meaning. Okay, again, this is a little snippet from the word sketch, just the, modify, the words it modifies, from 1990. Cloud in 1990, only modified cuckoo, droplet, cover, nine, and formation. Okay, 2014, we find that the most frequent word modified by cloud is computing. But in 1990, that didn't even exist. And you can see that, that it's now much more common as a modifier with computing than it is with cuckoo. Okay. Right, the next thing we're going to do is have a look at why we still need to use lexicographers. Okay. This is the thesaurus view for intelligent. So can we give these out, please? Thank you. Again, please share. 
This is the thesaurus view for intelligent, okay? And you can see that the thesaurus view tells us that clever is the most common synonym for intelligent. Uh, thoughtful is number two, then smart, then honest, then witty, etc., etc. But this is dangerous. We cannot take this at face value. We need to think about what this is showing us. What I've done is I've given you the sketch difference comparing clever and intelligent. Red, words that are highlighted in red go with clever. Words that are highlighted in green go with intelligent. What I want you to do is to take five minutes and work out one piece of very important information, usage information, that we would need to give to learners about clever and intelligent. What's really different about how they're used? Are they really interchangeable? Are they really synonymous? Don't answer from what you know. Look at the corpus data. Look at the corpus data. What's the corpus data showing you? Clever is... Intelligent is more positive. Do you, what do you think? Do you agree with that? What tells us that intelligent is more positive? How do we know that? Because we've got devilishly for clever. What else? What else? Well, you're, you're, you're right. Clever has very negative connotations now in contemporary English. If you describe somebody as clever, that's not necessarily a positive thing anymore. Look at the collocations. Manipulative, cunning. Look at the pre-modifiers. Look at the adverbs used before clever. Fiendishly, devilishly, wickedly, diabolically, frightfully, exceedingly, self-consciously. And look at, the, look at the collocations that go with, with intelligent, reasonably, precociously, emotionally, highly. And then lots more positive words here as well. Well-educated and intelligent. Compassionate, intelligent and compassionate. Intelligent and affectionate and caring and sensitive. So this is dangerous. It's not actually telling us. It's telling us the words are synonymous. They're used in similar ways. But actually, we still need the lexicographer to look at this to truly interpret the data to see what's going on with connotation in the corpus. Okay. So, there we go. The, word, the sketch difference reveals strong negative connotations for clever versus intelligent. And this is the kind of data that we need to use in our dictionaries to make sure that we're giving learners and users information about English as it's used today. In my talk tomorrow, I'm going to be talking about the history of the language and why it's important, I think, that teachers have some understanding of how much English has changed and of the forces that have acted on English to cause the change. We're in grave danger here, I think, in India and in other countries around the world of teaching a fossilized form of English, of teaching a form of English that we all learned when we were at school, but that actually isn't current anymore because the language has changed and moved on. So if you look up the word shall in the corpus, what do you think it's going to tell us? A lot of you will have learned this paradigm at school. A lot of you will be teaching this. Who teaches this paradigm? I shall. We shall. You. He. She. Will. Who teaches that? Who teach? Who, put your hands up if you teach that. 
Put your hands up if you teach that. Are you not, everybody who's not voting, are you not teaching this rule? I shall, we shall, you will, he will. Sorry? Okay. A lot of you are teaching this rule here in India. It's in Ren and Martin, which should be stacked up in a pile and burnt. That rule dates from the 18th century. If we want to teach 21st century English to our students, we need to rely on corpus-based evidence and books written using corpus, such as all of the Collins books. Corpus ensures our dictionaries and our reference books and our grammars are accurate, up to date, reflect 21st century English, not 18th century English, contain the right level of information for the user, and show usage as well as meanings. And if you want to have a look, it's available online. Unfortunately, it's a subscription service, but it is available online. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, some, there have been some questions. We've got a microphone yes, here. I have a question. Yeah, there's a. If you put your hand up, the. Okay. Uh, why does the word undergo a change? Why does word undergo a change? Very, very hard to say what motivates language change. It could be that um, other things are happening in the language and it moves around to fill a space. Um, if we think about mouse, somebody in about 1963 thought that the gadget they just invented to go with the computer, with the long wire, thought that's what it looked like. So they decided to associate that word with their new meaning that they'd made up. It could be that. Spellings have changed a lot over the past hundreds of years, but spelling is no longer changing. With the exception of what we do texting, spelling is fairly well established in English. Yes, spelling has changed a lot, but since the 19th century, spelling of English it hasn't really changed very much. It changed a lot over a thousand years, 1200 years, but it's not changing at the moment. Spelling isn't changing now. Usage is changing and meaning is changing and words are coming in. Lots of words come in from different languages. Okay, English is very, very acquisitive and that's another reason for language change. When you have a cup of, cup of coffee, do you order, who orders a cappuccino? Who orders a cappuccino when they have a cup of coffee? That word's come in from Italian. Who orders a latte when they have a cup of coffee? Or an espresso or an Americano? Those words have all come in from Italian. Um, let me think of some more examples. Who likes sushi? Some Japanese. Okay. Who does karate to keep fit? Some Japanese. Um, that's another main motivator for language change. English takes words from every language it encounters. Yeah, of course, hundreds of words. Chocolate from Aztec. Chocolate's an Aztec word. Yes, sir. Yes, um, my question is uh, related to uh, two of the aspects that you have mentioned. Yes. One of them is uh, that we are teaching the fossilized versions of language that you have made a reference of, which I say that the Collins uh, Bank of Online English, to what extent it takes the language in use in India that is one thing that worries me, whether it represents the Indian variety, that it is fossilized in India. The second one is that uh, in the morning when we had a session by uh, a person from Acer, uh, she made a mention of that at least 70% of the students in schools are not even aware of the simplest words of English. Now, if we bring this corpus evidence to classrooms, which is actually from the standard variety or from the native speaker countries, are we really be able to introduce this data to our students? In fact, it's a serious concern. Even the teachers will be will will they be able to understand? It's a question for all of us. When we were looking at the uh, A and B versions of the data, how many of us were able to infer the meaning senses of each concordance that we have read through? So, to what extent can we take it further? And then I agree with the fact that dictionaries should accommodate the changes that we. Uh, 
talk about, but uh, uh, could you please explain to what extent can we implement all these sure, ideas in sure, India? Sure, That's sure, what my sure, concern sure. is. Well, I'll deal, I'll, deal with your, I'll deal with your first question first. We have about 10 million words of Indian data in the corpus, and it's all identifiable, and we can extract it, and we can look for the use of shall and will in the Indian corpus and compare what's going on in India with what's going on in other parts of the world. And it's true, it's fossilized here in India. So we can look at what's going on in India. Um, it's really important that, as, you, as you've said, that we use this data to inform our dictionaries and our reference books. Um, it is quite hard for teachers to use in the classroom. I'm not necessarily advocating that you use it in the classroom, although you're very welcome to have a go. And if anybody is particularly interested, I have a couple of copies of some corpus data on a CD-ROM for people to take away and, and play around with. Um, one of the ways that you can use it in the classroom is just to look at more frequent words. But it is quite hard to use. One of the things we're always grappling with at Collins is whether we make this available to teachers to use in the classroom, whether we try and create some kind of front end that would make it easy for you to use so that you could set an exercise like the trip journey one for your students and then pull out key information for them to look at. And it's actually something that we're grappling with at the moment with a developer in China, how to make it easy for teachers to use. So we're trying to do that. If we were able to make it happen, who would use corpus data in the classroom? If we could make it really easy. Yeah, great. That's exactly what we're looking at, sir. So thank you for the question. Yeah. S sorry, sorry. Com uh, has Collins come up with a corpus of academic writing? We haven't got a corpus of academic writing. Our corpus is a corpus of general English. We could extract our academic texts from it and analyze them. But mostly what we use it for is for analyzing the general language. Thank you. Sorry, lady down here had a question? Sorry, can you use the microphone? So, Sorry, thank you. Thank you. Uh, what should we use in the classes, shell or will, in terms of exams? That's a difficult one. What does the CBSE expect? Does it expect fossilized English? You know, I don't think you should use shall. In the UK now, and in America, and Australia, and New Zealand, and Canada, shall is used when people want to try and be posh. If they want to try and impress you, they'll use shall. Will is just the general word now, and people are using shall to say, to imply that they're very posh, you know? So if I was wanting to be posh with you, I would say, Thank you very much. I shall now take questions. And I think I'm being posh. You know? If I didn't want to be posh, I would say, OK, I will now take questions. But in the models, I uh, teach children. In, uh, when we teach children uh, models, there's a model in English. Models, yeah. Yeah. Then uh, there too, we go, uh, used to change them. Uh, we use I will, where we want to con uh, convince others or uh, threatening that I will kill you, hmm. like that, or promise, uncertainty. For that purposes, we use will. Yes. With I and B. Yes. But yes. otherwise, we use uh, shell. Okay. Thank Can you. Can you clarify, please? <laughs> it's the same thing. To me, it's the same thing. You know, will is just the indicator of the future tense now. You know? Okay. How about one simple question, uh, More and more stress is on teaching grammar in this, over schools, and learning is based on uh, the scoring in the exams in the government schools. Yeah. Uh, what teacher can do to teach them uh, vocabulary in a very, very effective way? I to make them interested, very yeah. much interest, interesting. To teach interested children, in the to teach teach, children teach, vocabulary. Learning of vocabulary in the yeah. classrooms, yes. I, I, think, yes. I think one of the most interesting ways of teaching vocabulary is just to get children. I hate to say it, I know this is extremely old-fashioned, but just to get children to read. 
to read and read and read. That is the best way of learning more vocabulary. Yeah, reading leads to reading. enriching the vocabulary. Reading, yes, yeah, yes. reading. Yeah, Giving you. children books to read about different subjects, um, fiction, non-fiction. I think that's the best way to teach vocabulary. We'll come to you in a minute, sir. Yes. Uh, we in our classroom, we use B and C. So the British, BNC, yeah. yeah. So can you please explain what's the difference between BNC and your corpus? Okay, well, the British National Corpus is smaller. The Collins Corpus is a lot bigger. The Collins Corpus is older. The British National Corpus only goes back to about 1999. So we've got a lot more data in the Collins Corpus. That's the main difference. No, unfortunately not. Not at the moment. Yeah, but it's a lot smaller. But yeah. Uh, this is the website if you want to have a look at it. That's the website. Uh, this is what sorry, I, sorry. This we'll come to you in a minute, ma'am. Yeah. Yes. What I want to ask is this um, thing that you presented. It's not necessary. I mean, it represents the current change. Mm -hmm. it's, is that necessarily a good thing? For instance, the example that you gave uh, to use B like as a reporting structure uh, is actually discouraged, you know, because it's not a proper way of speaking. Yes or no? <laughs> so what you it's an argument, about, isn't it? It's an argument, isn't it, between the prescriptive, this is wrong because it's not in my grammar book, and the descriptive. This, is, this has to be right because it's how people are using the language. Okay? And English cannot be prescriptive because there is so much happening all the time. Who's going to be responsible for drawing the line about what is allowed and what isn't allowed? At what point is something that you've decided wasn't allowed 100 years ago, at what point is that going to be allowed because everybody is using it? Languages that are highly prescriptive are problematic languages. Chinese is highly prescriptive. To get a new word accepted into the Chinese language, there is a government body that sits on the word and passes judgment. So in China, everybody uses this word, shweping. Shweping means shopping. But it's not official. It's not in any dictionary. And you never hear it on the media, but in the street, everybody uses it. But the government are prescriptively saying, no, you're not allowed to use that word. It's not going in any dictionary because it's not official. But that language is not a language that people can learn and that people can be taught. You know, at what point then does the prescribed language become a completely different variety of what everybody speaks? Think about Arabic. Have we got any Arabic speakers here? So Arabic, when you're reading, you're reading a generalized modern standard Arabic. And when you listen to Al Jazeera, they're speaking a very neutral form of Arabic. But in your countries, you speak a form which is very local to your country. So the language that you speak and the language that you read write are quite different, I believe, yes? No, I don't think anybody should be allowed to do it. English isn't like that. It would be no good us all trying to speak like the gentleman at the beginning because that's how English was originally spoken, you know? And some of those words were written like this. Are we seriously suggesting that we never, ever change, that we go back to that, you know? That's drastic, I know. But... It doesn't take very many years for something to become drastic. Um, trying to think of a good example. If I come think of a good example, I'll come back to it. I think lady here has a question. Where's the? Can I, where's Hello. the mic? Oh, great. Uh, Ma'am, this exactly is not a question. Uh, with due respects to uh, what Job Collins is doing or any other corpus is doing. Uh, yeah, I'm not just uh, speaking about Indian context, uh, the context of many such countries like India. Uh, uh, two things is that uh, using the latest corpus in the classrooms 
uh, on one side we we speak about english 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 on the other side we speak about classrooms which do not even have uh, proper facilities i have seen students who cannot buy bags and they put their books in those rice bags which come and uh, so many things let us not speak about that and where do we stand actually by the time you give one more join one more word into this corpus the student where does he go and one thing is that these are all cost effective things no teacher can buy them and use garments also cannot buy and give them free of cost to the teachers but is there any middle path which can give really something that the teachers can use in the class and the students can also use in the class well i would say the, it's a it's a dictionary. It's a a, a, a Collins dictionary, particularly affordable. usability, affordable. So many. Partic it's not only affordability, ma'am. I'm also telling usability. Like what I mean to tell yeah, is. Yeah, ex ex exactly. I completely understand. What you want is a dictionary that moderates all the corpus data it's not and that gives you I'm what not, you need. I'm not speaking about dictionary. You were giving one example of how shall us mm. uh, and will these are facilitated mm. and how new forms mm. are coming. Mm. Is there anything that some definitely we need to follow only that which happens somewhere that the whole country has to follow? No, it's current usage. It's current usage. Current usage, but what, by what? the time, by the time, by the time uh, these countries, like my country, we follow it, it is facilitated again. I'm sorry, I'm not, I, that's how I told with due respects to everybody. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Or observations. I think that this is a language. I think that we, we as teacher has to learn, learn, and learn. At this lecture was very interest, interesting. I think so, and uh, it, it was very meaningful also. Simple things we all know. We learn from books. These were the new things I enjoyed very much. Thank you so. Thank, thank so you. Much. No, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, yeah. Please do. Yeah. So I think one question's been around, how do we actually use this in the classroom? And what I've done is I've used COCA, mm -hmm. which is the Corpus of Contemporary American, American English, English, which is yeah. free and available on the, on the net. And I've, what I wanted to show my students was uses of discuss with collocations. Um, because in India, most of our students tend to say discuss about, which is non-standard elsewhere. So we explored it using concordances. Mm -hmm. And they notice in the concordances that discuss is not followed by about, at least in the samples that I showed them. And they see patterns of usage that it's always discuss plus the object directly. So this is one way you could use it practically to explore language. Yeah. Did your students really learn from that experience? Great. Right. And how old are they? Adults. They're adults, aren't they? Yeah. But no, that's really good. That's a great idea. Any other questions? then school can subscribe and make it available in every classroom across. In that case, the school has to subscribe. Teachers use it in the class. Students use it in the class. There's that a higher end. Now coming to, we want to know what is the excess charge annually, six monthly, how much do we pay? I think you have to have a look at the website. I don't have the fees <coughs> with me. But I think you almost need to wait until we've created our new product that has got the front end that will make it really easy for you to use in the classroom. Because at the moment, it's quite difficult to use. You can choose a concordance or a word sketch or a, a thesaurus or a sketch diff. And I think you should wait until it's, a, it's, it's, it's really usable and then seriously think about using it in the classroom. Thank you, ma'am. I hope uh, that was an engaging session. Uh, with this, we can connect tomorrow. Uh, Dr. Higgleton would be again uh, giving a talk on why is English so difficult. So I invite you all to be present for the talk. Then you can have more discussion and more engagement on this particular topic. And I hope it would be interesting. Yeah. But before Those you go, who, yeah. we've got our crossword prize winners. So uh, if you announce the names, I'll give out the prizes. I, I, I can't say a lot of them. <laughs> 
अच्छा वो okay, जो um, reporting. We had floated our crossword puzzle contest yesterday, and many of you enthusiastically had taken part in it. Today we hereby announce the prize. Before we announce the prize, um, I'd like to tell you that uh, many uh, entries got disqualified because of either um, it was not complete or there were one or two. Wrong answers there. We would be displaying all the correct old, answers at our stall, so you can have a look at it. We have got 13 correct entries, and we are giving well, prizes to all these 13. Left. And um, uh, what we have done is we have not only checked the correct answers, we have also marked here as per the submission time. so correct entries but as per you have submitted accordingly first second third prizes have been chosen so the first prize goes to s bhuvaneshwari s bhuvaneshwari she isn't here s bhuvaneshwari we can keep it she can take it from our stall our second prize goes to j Pakia Mariana Nancy Not here Third prize goes to P Vinotha Not here unfortunately Fourth prize goes to R Jagannathan Is he here R Jagannathan no No Fifth prize goes to Susai Rathinam A Susai Rathinam A has won the first prize second prize j pakia mariana nancy third prize p vinotha all right uh, fifth prize susai rathinam a no not here sixth prize pamchila hangio 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 okay Pamchila Angio, sixth prize, ma'am. Seventh prize goes to Kanika Kumar. Kanika Kumar, great. She's here. She's here. Can we please congratulate the winners? Thank you. Eighth prize goes to Iqbal Khan. Great work. Congrats. Thank you so much. Ninth prize goes to Rosim Hetha. Great. All right. Uh, friend of Rosie Mehta. Tenth one goes to Mrs. Sunitha Singh. Eleventh prize goes to Mr. Bhupinder Singh. Mr. Bhupinder Singh. Department of Education, Government of Himachal Pradesh. Uh, just a second i'll yes second prize j pakia mariana nancy 12th one goes to mr yogesh ishwar boy yogesh great congrats and the last one that's the 13 last but not the least of course gina george Gina George no thank you so much for attending our workshop see you tomorrow at the talk have a nice day